Simon, there's a bit to get through uh, this week. Really interesting to see this visit uh, from the Chinese Premier. D is this something that really uh, engages the Australian public? How do they view a visit like this and our relationship with China? Yeah, thanks, Laura. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to suggest, you know, it's, it's not an issue like cost of living that sort of comes up at the top of the list of, of every group we do. But it is this thing that keeps coming up every now and again, sort of as you get deeper into the conversations with people about the importance of this relationship with China. Pe people have some really interesting nuanced views around it. And so what you see regularly pretty often is this view that one of, one of the good things that, that the Albanese government has done, you know, we, we get a lot of critique and commentary that we talk about on this show, but one of the good things that, that come up quite regularly is this idea of restoring the relationship with China. It, it's particularly strong, but not exclusively, particularly strong among folk that, that work or even own businesses and industries that sort of rely on China for, for trade, you know, for exports and even supply lines, those sorts of things. So there is this sort of sense of, economic relationship and and an appetite for a warm sort of trade relationship between China. People look at that and see that as a good thing. There are, though, at the same time, hesitations around the relationship. Um, so, you know, obviously one of the, the concerns is around sort of national security and China's intentions, particularly in our region of the world. Um, you know, and, and Concerns talk about sort of possibility of conflict one day, those sorts of things. But, but there's this interesting sort of almost counterintuitive, almost like a backhander kind of um, sense of confidence that people have that, that we, no, we're not going to come to blows with China. And, and that sort of backhanded compliment is because why would China need to go to war with us when they pretty much own everything that they'd want to own in Australia anyway? Mm. And... That, this has some really interesting political ramifications because they don't blame China for that. China's just doing what, you know, it's just buying what it needs. They they really hold the government and successive gov governments of both sides of politics to account for sort of selling off key strategic assets and those yeah. sorts of things to, to China. So, some yeah, some really interesting nuanced views that do have some positive political ramifications, but also some negative ones as well. When we talk about Chinese-born voters, there's often not a lot of <laughs> nuance when we talk about it in this kind of setting. What is the assumption there? Uh, and what is the actual research that you're getting about the way Chinese-born voters vote? Um, are they more likely to vote um, for Labor, who ha now has a better uh, relationship with their homeland? Or are they in Australia for a reason, if you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I think the first really interesting thing about Chinese-born voters is, is, is to recognise that they, they aren't a homogenous group. There's often in, in, in the political world this assumption that they sort of vote en bloc, en masse, as, as, yeah. a, as a homogenous unit. That, that's not true. There are cultural and economic diversity within that group that, that sort of blow in, blow in different directions. Having said that, in, in broader terms, yeah, what, what we've seen is since really it goes back to the pandemic, and the erosion of that relationship between Australia and the government at the time around China, we saw Chinese voters start to to become a bit more volatile, to, to move around. Um, you know, and the Aston by-election was a classic example of that. So at the moment, Labor is doing all right in amongst those voters. Mm. Now, the current, you know, like every other voter, the current economic circumstances and those sorts of things is going to put that under strain. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do know that when they vote on economic grounds, they tend to vote more conservatively. So whether that's going to produce a swing coming into the next election, I, I think those boring old domestic political issues that, that we <laughs> talked about are, are going to be probably just as influential as the, as the bigger strategic international relations kind if, of If I could get you to comment on um, two polls we saw this week, Freshwater and Resolve. Resolve putting Peter Dutton ahead on uh, preferred uh, Prime Minister and also, you know, on, on some of those key credentials, seeing Peter Dutton as a stronger leader than Anthony Albanese. A, does that matter? <laughs> or, or that metric at all? Um, and B, is that what you're seeing in your research as well? I mean, at the beginning of the year, Simon, we are talking about this uh, real threat to Labor and Anthony Albanese and they needed to step something up. Has that happened or Peter Dutton turning the conversation back to cost of living in the whole energy debate, has that been a masterstroke from him? Yeah, look, I think the sort of the, the overall takeout of, of those um, 
uh, poles for, for 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 mine is is not so much it's it's a masterstroke. The, the the takeout for mine is really the pox on both their houses kind of mm -hmm. message that that comes out of it. You know, this big and growing cohort in the middle that don't want either of them. Yeah. Um, and and you know, you and I have talked about this many times before about this this sort of growing third party third way vote um, that I think we're going to increasingly see. But but absolutely, I mean. At the end of the day, though, the trend is the trend, and, and the trend is not the friend of, of, of Anthony Albanese. I think the continued loss of altitude on primary, the continued loss of altitude on that that preferred prime minister, which is not hugely predictive, never mm. has really been hugely predictive, except at the extremes. Um, so when it's sort of 50-50 in the middle, that to me just says a, mm. a an electorate that's kind of apathetic and uninspired by either choice. Yeah, but when you're talking about, you know, again, not no homogenous groups here when it comes to voting blocs, um, and I agree that, you know, there's not one single issue that drives voters, even though cost of living might be front of mind. But when you're getting into the climate change uh, debate and cost of living is so front of mind for people, does that then change? I mean, within households, people having to make decisions about paying bills and, and what they do and their priorities. And it seems like, you know, in this climate debate, is there now a growing cohort of people are saying, look, we want to do more about climate change. Yes, we want to meet our Paris agreements, but I can't afford it. Uh, we can't afford it right now and we're paying the cost of it. So therefore, maybe it's not as big a priority as it used to be. Yeah, th this interesting thing happens around when you talk about sort of the, the cost of living implications of, of climate, if I, if I can for a second. So yeah. it's more around particularly in the energy space. So, so what folk are saying is a big component of our sort of rising utility bills is an over-reliance on um, a small number of generators uh, that can sort of manipulate the market. You know, this, this idea of sort of corporate price gouging, these sorts of ideas, mm. this um, sort of permeate the discussion. In that context, what they're saying is well, this is this is actually the attractiveness of renewable energy is that it diversifies that sort of production base, if you will, and you know the old supply versus demand. Well, if there's more supply, there's more diverse supply, there's more plays in the market. At at the very least, it might not stop prices from going up because we don't believe right. that once things have gone up, they come back down again. It might not stop prices from going up, but it might slow them down. So there's yeah, there's this really interesting so the justification for, for renewables becomes not so much about climate. That's sort of like, yeah, it does that too. Great, tick the box. Mm. Um, but really it's about this diversification of our of our energy mix and and hopefully sort of the, the market benefits that, that come from that. Yeah, perhaps that's more a comment on corporate Australia than anything else uh, and institutions and the loss of faith in them. But uh, conversation for another time. Perhaps, Simon, we'll see you soon. Thanks, Laura.